Chapter 14 of The Red and the Black, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Red and the Black, Volume 1 by Stendhal, translated by Horace B. Samuel. Chapter 14, The English Scissors. A young girl of 16 had a pink complexion, and yet used red rouge, polydori. Foucault's offer had, as a matter of fact, taken away all Julian's happiness. He could not make up his mind to any definite course. Alas, perhaps I'm lacking in character. I should have been a bad soldier of Napoleon. At least, he added, my little intrigue with the mistress of the house will distract me a little. Happily for him, even in this little subordinate incident, his inner emotions quite failed to correspond with his flippant words. He was frightened of Madame de Renal because of her pretty dress. In his eyes, that dress was a vanguard of Paris. His pride refused to leave anything to chance in the inspiration of the moment. He made himself a very minute plan of campaign, molded on the confidences of Foucault and a little that he had read about love in the Bible. As he was very nervous, though he did not want to admit it to himself, he wrote down this plan. Madame de Renal was alone with him for a moment in the drawing-room on the following morning. "'Have you no other name except Julian?' she said. Our hero was at a loss to answer so flattering a question. This circumstance had not been anticipated in his plan. If he had not been stupid enough to have made a plan, Julian's quick wit would have served him well, and the surprise would only have intensified the quickness of his perception. He was clumsy and exaggerated his clumsiness— Madame de Renal quickly forgave him. She attributed it to a charming frankness, and an air of frankness was the very thing which, in her view, was just lacking in this man who was acknowledged to have so much genius. "'That little tutor of yours inspires me with a great deal of suspicion,' said Madame Derville to her sometimes. "'I think he looks as if he were always thinking, and he never acts without calculation. He is a sly fox.' julian remained profoundly humiliated by the misfortune of not having known what answer to make to madame de renal a man like i am ought to make up for this check and seizing the moment when they were passing from one room to another he thought it was his duty to give madame de renal a kiss nothing could have been less tactful nothing less agreeable and nothing more imprudent both for him and for her they were within an inch of being noticed madame de renal thought him mad she was frightened and above all shocked this stupidity reminded her of monsieur valenod what would happen to me she said to herself if i were alone with, with him all her virtue returned because her love was waning she so arranged that one of her children always remained with her julian found the day very tedious and passed it entirely and clumsily putting into operation his plan of seduction. He did not look at Madame de Renal on a single occasion without the look having a reason, but nevertheless he was not sufficiently stupid to fail to see that he was not succeeding at all in being amiable, and was succeeding even less in being fascinating. Madame de Renal did not recover from her astonishment at finding him so awkward and at the same time so bold. It is the timidity of love in men of intellect, she said to herself with an inexpressible joy. Could it be possible that he had never been loved by my rival? After breakfast, Madame de Renal went back to the drawing room to receive the visit of Monsieur Charcot de Moron, the sub prefect of Bray. She was working at a little frame of fancy work some distance from the ground. Madame Derville was at her side. That was how she placed when our hero thought it suitable to advance his boot in the full light and press the pretty foot of Madame de Renal, whose open work stockings and pretty Paris shoe were evidently attracting the looks of the gallant sub prefect. Madame de Renal was very much afraid, and let fall her scissors, her ball of wool, and her needles, so that Julian's movement could be passed for a clumsy effort intended to prevent the fall of the scissors which presumably he had seen slide. Fortunately, these little scissors of English steel were broken, and Madame de Renal did not spare her regrets that Julian had not succeeded in getting nearer her. You noticed them falling before I did. You could have prevented it instead, all your zealousness only succeeding in giving me a very big kick. All this took in the sub-prefect, but not Madame Derville. That pretty boy is very silly manners, she thought. 
the social code of a provincial capital never forgives this kind of lapse madame de renal found an opportunity of saying to julian be prudent i order you julian appreciated his own clumsiness he was upset he deliberated with himself for a long time in order to ascertain whether or not he ought to be angry at the expression i order you he was silly enough to think she might have said i order you if it were some question concerning the children's education but in answering my love she puts me on an equality it is impossible to love without equality and all this mind all his mind ran riot in making commonplaces on equality he angrily repeated to himself that verse of Corneille which Madame Derville had taught him some days before. before. L'amour fait les égalés et ne les cherche pas. Julian, who had never had a mistress in his whole life, but yet insisted on playing the role of a Don Juan, made a shocking fool of himself all day. He had only one sensible idea. Bored with himself and Madame de Renal, he viewed with apprehension the advance of the evening when he would have to sit by her side in the darkness of the garden. He told Monsieur de Renal that he was going to Verrieres to see the curé. He left after dinner and only came back in the night. At Verrieres, Julien found Monsieur Chalon occupied in moving. He had just been deprived of his living. The curate Maslon was replacing him. Julian helped the good curé, and it occurred to him to write to Foucault that the irresistible mission which he felt for the holy ministry had previously prevented him from accepting his kind offer, but that he had just seen an instance of injustice, and that perhaps it would be safer not to enter into holy orders. Julian congratulated himself on his subtlety in exploring the dismissal of the curé of Verrieres, so as to leave himself a loophole for returning to commerce in the event of a gloomy prudence routing the spirit of heroism from his mind. End of chapter 14